was all the looking at Rashad before <laughs> the shots. I, uh, I told him everything I heard. And then I said to him, it's very difficult for me. I, when I'm in the shower, I relive her shouts. You said to him that when you're in the shower, you relive the shouts. A terrifying screams. That was Michelle Berger's testimony on the 4th of March 2014. Now, for me, the entire Oscar trial really hinged on two details. And the first was, did a woman scream at any point during the, the evening, at any point? Also, were the lights on? You know, also at any point during the evening when they were supposed to be sleeping. Did a woman scream and, and was a light on? And, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned, within the first 45 minutes uh, of the trial commencing, the Oscar trial, um, both those questions were answered. And, um, you know, a, a woman was screaming uh, a lot and, and um, lights were on prior to the shots going off. And... Um, seemed pretty open and shut to me and um so it was a, it was a shock the the result it was it was shocking that in oscar's version uh he silences reva and he, he not only silences her but he also extinguishes her he makes her invisible you know she's she's at pitch dark so he can't see her um uh, she she makes no sound, and in fact, the only screaming is his screaming, and and, and he screams like a woman. And um, what was even more appalling after that was that um, the judge uh, accepted this version. Uh, judge Masip actually dismissed um, all the eyewitness uh, testimony, and basically saying, "Well, you know, it wasn't completely clear, so so um, we're gonna dismiss all of it." And um, you know, I thought that was pretty unsophisticated of her. And so I guess what followed the those revelations uh, in March was uh, the sort of uh, consistent narrative from the defense and from Oscar that Reva was just completely extinguished in, in the whole thing. Um, everything was, was all about Oscar and... And this disturbed me, and um, you know, uh, I just spend more and more time uh, being, I guess, disturbed by uh, the lack of um, of uh, Reva's narrative. Lady, I'm I'm as honest as I can be to the court. I'm just saying what I heard. And I'm giving my story as clearly as I can. Shall I ask you a last time and then move on and see if you're willing to consider that? On a version that a man has a gun, he wants to kill his girlfriend, he wants to shoot her. She runs away from him, she hides in the toilet and he shot her through the toilet door. One part of your evidence of, is inconsistent of your observations, what you have. And that is a man shouting for help in that series of events to the extent that also that shout the caused lady, you to think they were attacked and it was a house The lady afterwards, after I heard what happened, the only thing I can now sit and ask is, was it a mockery? I don't know. Yes. I'm not Mr. Pistorius. I do not know. You, I cannot answer on behalf of him. You, I answered, don't know. I'm very happy with your answer because that's what I'm going to argue. You will even call it a mockery other than to make an obvious concession. That's what I put here. You will even go so far, ma'am, to call it a mockery with no facts, just not to make a single concession that can help that man. That's it. As far as I was concerned, Michelle Berger was the star witness of the Oscar trial. Um, and what she said there was was probably one of the truest um, observations of the trial, which is that you know what actually happened at the end of the day was a mockery. Um, you know what happened uh, in the actual incident, and 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 Oscar saying that you know he thought it was a, b a burglar, 
um, it really makes a mockery of, of, of what actually happened that night and it makes a mockery of Reva. It's easy to say these things in retrospect. I mean, we know what happened now, but, but obviously at the time, all of us were, were waiting. We, we, we weren't sure what was, what, what was going to be the case. We, we weren't sure whether what, what had happened. You know, did a woman scream or not? Um, you know, was Berger possibly mistaken? But then her husband also heard a woman screaming. So did um, at least two or three other witnesses. And... Um, but you know, obviously, before before all the evidence was in, uh, we held our breath and we needed to hear what Oscar said and and whether that came across as credible. And um, ultimately, not many people believed him. And um, and then a lot of people watching the case, overseas media, local media, um, most people from from where I was standing um, felt that. Um, the evidence seemed to show that that, that Oscar was um, was culpable. Um, a couple of months later, around about three or four months later, um, the, the trial wasn't over, but it was um, it was July, and um, it happened to be the coldest week of the year. Um, the Sixth of July, uh, certainly where I was in Bloemfontein, was minus six eleven. The the seventh was minus eight. The uh, the tenth was minus nine degrees. Uh, you know, the, the coldest temperatures of the whole year, and ironically enough, in that coldest week of the year was when the reenactment video was released, and um, um, it was a extremely stressful period for me. Um, you know, I just brought out my third book on the Oscar trial. Um, it was new to me, writing books for Amazon. Um, I was extremely sleep deprived, especially on that particular day, on the Sunday. And um, and uh, and it was extremely cold. And, uh, you know, funnily enough, it's, it's, it's about a year later today. You know, as I'm recording this, it's uh, the 22nd of July. And if you look at the temperatures, um, you know, the coldest temperature for the whole of July this year is in the order of minus four, um, you know, and uh, the maximums are, are, are tend to be a lot higher, um, 15 um, and, and 14 and 16, whereas, you know, the maximums in July 2014 were around about 11. So it was substantially colder July 2014. Anyway, it was against this background that um, I had to go into a studio and give my first radio interview. And, you know, it was in a way, it was a big moment, but it was also um, kind of a horrible moment because I was extremely tired. I'd, I'd um, really burned the candle at both ends. And, um, um, you know, I finally actually just took a time out, probably about an hour before my, my interview. And, literally lay on the floor uh, next to the heater and um, just got um, half an hour sleep just before I went into the studio. And um, and then, um, you know, and then there was a, a, a pretty interesting interview with uh, the OFM presenter, your name for Nastian, and uh, it's quite an interesting discussion, which ended up being um, all of 77 minutes. Um, and, um, you know, when you hear the interview, I, I don't think I sound very tired but i was i was certainly extremely um extremely tired and um um before um before i got there i, I was really concerned that i was going to be um um not not very comprehensible to other people but uh the important part of the interview for me was um you know, the the presenter wanted to know about Reva and he wanted to know about Reva in her own words and he was quite fascinated with the um with a book I'd written which was Reva in her own words. And um essentially what it was was um, you know, I discovered that, that Reva and I were friends on Facebook after the fact. Um, you know, um I just happened to type her name into Facebook and 
because I, I thought, what are the chances that we were friends on Facebook? And it turn, turned out that we were. And to be honest, I don't, didn't really remember adding her or not. And, um, and there she was. And um, it was quite um, poignant seeing, you know, seeing her last words. And you know, I recognized um, the photographer that, that she thanked. In fact, one of the last things she'd said on her Facebook was, thank you to her photographer. And, um, you know, I went through a little bit more of a timeline and there was a, a drawing, um, which, which was the message just passing through. And when I saw that drawing, I, I, I really got a, a deep sense of Reva. Um, you know, I photo, I'm also a photographer and I, um, you know, I've, I've done quite a few shoots myself and, it's unusual to see a model interested in art the way that that Reva was, and um, and prior to the just passing through drawing, there was another cartoon of Anani Boyson, and it was a girl who had been violently um, assaulted and raped in um, Radarsdorp. and uh, there was a, this this picture she'd put on there, and and, and Reva said, you know, well. I woke up safe uh, in my home and, um, you know, that particular incident disturbed me so much. Um, I actually took that incident. It was literally where a, a young girl had been, you know, she'd been disemboweled basically. She'd, she'd, she'd had her, her abdomen sliced open and, and a, a glass bottle had actually been put in in. in Side her stomach, and um, you know she she survived the experience only to die, obviously very traumatically, um, sometime later, and um, I found it extremely disturbing, and so much so that that at the time I was working on a fiction book, and I and I actually used that, um, that that you know the 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 reality of of what actually happened to her, and I and I used it to describe a particularly evil character and, and something that he does and and what I'm trying to get at is that's the impact that 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 incident had on me and obviously had a big impact on Reva and in any way um you know um the more that I went into Reva's timeline the more um I felt that she really resonated with me and it was in a number of areas you now I'm, I'm someone who does photography I I'm to some extent exposed to to the glamour and and then also to the the rigors on the other side you know on the one hand there's the five star lifestyle the, the the glamour the the vips that you come across um, but while it's an overprivileged lifestyle it, it's also um kind of underpaid um and 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 the financial struggle was something that i could really identify with reva reva moved often she was often sick um, she was struggling to emerge and uh, arguably she hadn't emerged when she died. And I think she was emerging when she died, but I mean, you know, the, the same could apply to me. Um, it's been a long struggle for me. And Reeve had spent about five years, um, you know, trying to assert herself and she'd lost as much as 15 kilograms trying to be the FHM um, face of, 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 of FHM. And um, and having achieved that, she didn't want to be the sort of um, bikini bimbo. She wanted to be a sort of a more of a classy, um, of a classier image. And um, and I found that all very interesting. And I, and I found her um, the way she presented herself on Facebook very mature, very grown up, very. She just seemed like a very well brought up uh, young woman. And and that impressed me, and um, and I found as I went further back into the timeline, that she basically laid down a narrative, and and it was a an interesting narrative. It was also a heroic narrative. It was someone who overcame the odds, and 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 she had a lot against her. You know, she had to, she was she was following her dream. She her, her, her dream was was the whole modeling thing, and. She wasn't quite right. Uh, she wasn't quite tall enough, and she didn't let that get her down. And and she, she was very intelligent about it, and and uh, working very hard, and um, obviously intelligent and and talented. And and she was really um, 
you know, putting her money where her mouth was and, and really um, doing her best. And and at the same time, she was supporting her parents and um, um, all of this impressed me. But right next to that, there were other things going on. There was a cancer scare. There was a break-in at her mother's house, um, which which Reva was there at the time as well. There was also... Um, There was also death. There were there were there were also family members that were several people dying, um, you know, um, at fairly regular intervals. And one just got the sense of wow, you know, Reva's trying so hard to to um, you know make a success of her life, find happiness, and and she and there was this entropy and this constant drag, you know, the the, the struggle with money um, and. And then there was the, also the relationship with um, with Warren, and um, that formed a, a a very interesting kind of precursor, kind of a backdrop to Oscar. You know, it was a, a wealthy guy. He was overseas for extended periods of time, and um, and she didn't like that. You know, I think she liked Warren. That they were a very good match, but um, it 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 ate at her. The the she she wanted someone with her, and she wanted to. Um, you know, ever ever shared um, romance, and um, in the end, she broke up with with Warren because they weren't together enough. And um, and uh, so, what's ironic is 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 on the day that Reva died, you know, Oscar wanted to take Reva with him overseas, and she was honoring her clients. That that is why she didn't go. Um, I'm sure she wanted to be um, in a in a fixed relationship with Oscar, but or, or, or with any with with the the person she was romantically involved with, but um, she couldn't lay down her clients, and um, you know it's more than likely that was a bit of a deal breaker for her, realizing that Oscar was going to be away for a length of time, and 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 um, that would have been upsetting to her. It would also have been upsetting to Oscar. But uh, in in some the, the thing that. Um, disturbed me the most I guess about Reva was the lack of her story in the media the, the lack of her story even in court um, th there was not much representation of Reva um, in court um, uh, Kim Martin was the only person to really um, testify on on a family member's behalf and, and it was actually a very touching testimony and a necessary one um, but unfortunately her mother and father didn't and 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 her mother and father haven't really been that vocal in the media certainly not the uh, not the local media um, what's uh, interesting is is also that um, today um, we find a story about um, the policeman uh, who um, took the police photos of the crime scene, um, warrant officer Monet Dutoy, and um, he um, suffered such stress, um, you know, taking crime scene photos, including um, of Reva's, uh, of the crime scene, you know, where Reva died, um, that uh, he needed to be hospitalized. And I think this gives one a, a real sense um, of what what we're actually talking about is that a you know, young woman, um, beautiful woman, um, lost her life. You know she, she and she lost it violently. You know there was um, a lot of blood lost and um, and a wonderful life lost. And you know in in um, one of our narratives, um, working with Lisa Wilson in California, we actually hyperlinked. Um, one of the last sentences r related to Reva, we, we hyperlinked an image to her body lying at the bottom of the stairs. And, and that was shocking to me. Um, uh, Lisa was aware of this image and I, I wasn't. And, and um, Lisa then directed me to this image of Reva, um, you know, lifeless, lying at the bottom of the stairs. And, and you saw this you saw her foot basically um, closest to the camera, and 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 it kind of 
for some reason, um, it, it's a similar image to the one we see of Meredith Kircher, who was the victim in the Amanda Knox case. Um, you also just see a, um, a, a foot sticking out. And, um, you know, th there's something... Um, there's something um, terrifying, actually, about this. You know, the the foot seems completely, the, the leg seems completely unscathed, um, healthy. Um, you know, it just seems like a normal foot, but it's attached to um, a body that that has been um, bled bled out and um, and and uh, in an extremely painful way. And so it's within this context that um, you know one actually looks at this and and then sees the person who did this to her uh, serves ten months in jail and um, the person who did this to her claims he never saw her claims that she never screamed claims that she was not in any fear claims that he's innocent claims that he's not a murderer um, claims that he He's the victim, and um, so it's against this um, background that that I felt quite a strong sense of mission. You know that I wanted to be Reva's voice in in the absence of her voice, um, and um, you know what's what is particularly chilling for me, and and um, you know I really felt Michelle Berger really provided a lot of the conscience I thought that that that, that the um, the case required. Um, you know, I don't know if people remember, but the, the case started off with a hysterical woman talking about Oscar's mental state, and it happened to be the ex-wife of um, Oscar's doctor. And that was actually how the court, the, the court case started. And um, and then um, uh, and and then Michelle Berger testified, and she was, I thought, very credible. And um, one of the things that she said that really stuck by me was, was she said that. Um, where they stay in this estate, um, you know, it borders a sort of a wild area, and um, she'd sometimes mistaken the howling of 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 jackals for a wild jackal for um, almost like this sort of ghost ghostly woman screaming, you know, in, in the silence of the night, and uh, it made me think of um, of um, the movie The Silence of the Lambs and. I don't know if you remember the agent Clarice Starling who, who who said that you know she was trying to silence the lambs, the, the screaming of the lambs, and 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 that's partly why she became an FBI agent. And I guess in a way that that's why we've written these narratives is to make these screams which have been which have been um, ignored, which have been unanswered, which have been suppressed, which have been. Um, made a mockery of we, we want to to um, hear them so that they can um, rest in peace what became of your lamb glory thank you you still wake up sometimes don't you wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lamb Do you think if you save poor Catherine, you could make them stop, don't you? You think if Catherine lives, you won't wake up in the dark ever again to that awful screaming of the lamb? I don't know. 